ビデオ The harem genre of anime is one of the more malign genres of anime, and for good reason. We've talked before about how it's a genre designed specifically to pander to its audience of lonely nerds, how the vast majority of harem anime are there to market figurines, cosplays, and unofficial adults-only comics, how even the top tier of its genre still fall into the realm of guilty pleasures. But I've never been comfortable with writing off entire genres as unworthy of my time. There's at least a couple of harem anime that are great in their own right. And wouldn't you know it, one of them happens to be the franchise that popularized the genre in the first place. The Tenchi Muyo franchise has been a staple of many an old school anime fan. Whether you were a collector of VHSs ordered from the backs of catalogs, or someone who made it a point to catch Toonami every day after school, it would come to no surprise that Tenchi Muyo was at least one of the animes that was a part of your world. For most of the late 90s and early 2000s, Tenchi Muyo was one of the most recognizable animes for young American anime fans. Okay, so it wasn't really up there with Dragon Ball, Pokemon, or Sailor Moon in terms of big names, but show a person who came of age in that time, and I'm sure you could elicit an, oh well, yeah, I remember that show. As for my own thoughts on Tenchi Muyo, they are kind of hard to describe. On one hand, I'm not as overly gushy about it like I am with franchises such as Slayers, Hunter x Hunter, or One Piece. You're not going to see me crawl up to you, grab you by the shirt, and demand you watch Tenchi Universe right then and there. But on the other hand, I will gladly watch nearly any Tenchi anime you put in front of me. I said nearly. To me, Tenchi Muyo is the perfect comfort food anime. It's got likable cute characters with visually appealing designs, lighthearted comedy, thrilling action scenes, and relatively easy to follow stories in spite of its notoriously complex world building. Being that Kyoto Video is a show devoted to examining the history of old anime while breaking it down and analyzing them through a more critical lens, it was obvious we would be getting to Tenchi sooner or later. We only have to ask, where to start? Well, it's certainly obvious that the best place to start would be where most anime fans started with Tenchi Muyo. And that's with Tenchi the Movie, Tenchi Muyo in Love. Come to you across the divide Looking out. <laughs> Funny story that. America's first exposure to Tenchi Muyo did not come from the OVA series that started it all. It was actually the first Tenchi movie. First released on VHS on August 20th, 1996, and airing on the Sci Fi Channel almost a week later, this movie was some people's first look at a franchise that would become a big part of anime fandom for the next couple of years. But was that really the best call? Is Tenchi Muyo in Love a proper introduction to the franchise? Tenchi Muyo in Love being the first piece of Tenchi media you're exposed to is a funny thing to me. It certainly does a lot of things right that shine a good light to the franchise, but at the same time, it does quite a bit of things that don't exactly make it the best first impression. Or to put it more simply, it's one of those animes where your enjoyment of the product is proportional to the prior knowledge you have of the franchise in question. So what exactly does that mean for Tenji Muyo in Love? Well, let's take a look. But we really can't talk about Tenji Muyo in Love proper without talking about the Tenji Muyo brand itself. We'll disregard everything that involves the alternate universes, continuities, and family trees because discussing those would require its own video. All you need to know is that Tenchi Masaki is an ordinary high school student training to be a Shinto priest who through various means come into contact with a group of cute girls from outer space. The forward rough around the edges space pirate Ryoko, the prim and proper princess Ayaka, the cute and kindly little sister of Ayaka Sasami, the motherly yet egomaniacal mad scientist Washu, the dumb as a sack of hammers galaxy police officer Mihoshi, and depending on which continuity you're watching, Mihoshi's long-suffering partner, Kiyoni. The characters and their exact relationships will change depending on the continuity, but there are some consistencies that link them all together. 
Tenchi will always have some connection to the all-powerful Jirai royal family. This is not only to draw conflict to the planet Earth, but also to grant Tenchi the hereditary superpowers associated with the Jirai royal family. But probably the most recognizable string that travels through all iterations of Tenchi Muyo would be that Tenchi is always, and I mean always, being beset and fought over by a gaggle of cute girls. It's a simple enough springboard that allows for a lot of potential for storytelling, whether they be in space or on Earth. But all this information is completely necessary to know because the movie doesn't really give you much of this information to go on. With this movie being the first step the franchise took stateside, it's honestly a miracle and a half that Tenchi even got off the ground in the first place. Okay, so picture this. It's 1996. You're an unemployed nerd in their late teens to early 20s. You've really been getting into this new stuff called Japanimation through the tapes you see at your local comic book store. The Sci-Fi Channel is airing stuff like Robot Carnival and Vampire Hunter D. And you begin to see a commercial for a premiere for a brand new anime movie called Tenchi Muyo in Love, and you are pumped. August 26 rolls around, late Monday night, Clear the schedule, lock the doors, keep the sun kiss cold, and the dominoes warm because you are about to watch a brand new anime you know nothing about. And within the first 15 minutes, you are going to be completely and totally lost. Tenchi Muyo in Love is a Tenchi Muyo movie made for people who already know Tenchi Muyo. Yes, this certainly does feel like I'm stating the self-evident, but at the same time, movies that are based on existing media should take some time at the beginning to get the audience up to speed. People going into this movie blind have to at least know what the setting is, who the characters are, and what are their personalities and relationships with one another. Tenchi Muyo in Love pretty much starts with the assumption that you already know everything there is to know about Tenchi Muyo. The characters are introduced with such little fanfare that it can take a while for a non-fan to figure out who they are and what do they do. But once they figure that out, the anime will start slinging Tenchi nomenclature at you such as Jirai or Galactic Police at you with barely explanation of what those things are and why they are important. But the height of the beginning going way too fast for its non-Tenchi audience would be the scene that comes right after the title screen where a slow montage plays out of a day at the local high school with the Tenchi characters inserted into it. This scene is meant to be in in media res and does do a good job of piquing one's curiosity of where our characters are and how did they get there in the first place, but it might be too much for viewers new to this franchise who at this point have no idea who these characters are or what their importance is and can easily just be a turnoff to them. The whole introduction for Tenchi Muyo in Love is the equivalent of being thrown into the deep end for first timers, so in order to get the most out of the story, you would have to have some passing familiarity with the Tenchi universe. So what actually is Tenchi Muyo in Love about? Well, the main story centers around a Hexus light villain named Kane escaping from a Galaxy Police Supermax prison in order to kill the remnants of the dry royal family, Reed Tenchi. And he plans on doing this by going back to 1970 Japan and erasing Tenchi's mother from existence, thus ensuring Tenchi and the rest of the remnants of the Jirai royal family go extinct. Catching this before Tenchi completely disappears from existence, Washu sends Tenchi and the girls back in time to stop Kane and to protect Tenchi's mother and her high school crush, aka Tenchi's father. And from there, Tenchi and the girls attend high school while trying to figure out the best course of action against Kane while helping Tenchi's father fall in love with Tenchi's mother at the Enchantment Under the Sea dance. I'm sure I'm not mixing this movie up with anything else. So yeah, we got ourselves a time travel story. And it's a relatively simple one. Just characters going back in time and making sure no one gets erased from existence. But like with most time travel stories, it's best not to examine it too closely because boy do they play fast and loose with the timeline. They try to keep a low profile by being in disguise, but that's asking for the moon when you have Ryoko and Ayaka in the same room. And pretty much when all is said and done and everything gets wrapped up, they all kind of shrug everything off with a, yeah, we didn't change too much. The Tokyo Tower's a wreck. 
Is it going to be all right? Washu told me that the authorities will probably chalk the whole thing up as an unexplained event. <laughs> But we'd be here all day if we went over every time travel inconsistency in this anime. If we really want to talk about the big problem with this anime story-wise, then let's talk villain. At first glance, Kane looks intimidating both in design and voice. He really sells you on the fact that he is an extra-dimensional threat and a being of pure evil. How pitiful that your skill as an operative has helped seal your fate. No one can withstand the power of Cain. But that's all he has going for it. Outside of the evil look factor, Cain is a purely generic villain. Right down to the name, Cain. He's less of a character and more of an obstacle that our heroes have to overcome. And any character he does have is spent all on snarling and evil laughter. I don't even think he gets a line until an hour into the film. And if you're wondering why he hates the Jirai royal family so much that the first thing he does after getting out of jail is to go back in time and kill one of the remaining heirs to the family, the answer is simple. Just because. And that mysterious classmate that the camera is always showing to be glaring at Tenchi's parents and is all but saying that it's Kane in disguise? Nope, it's total red herring. It's a rogue galaxy police agent who gets killed off immediately and unceremoniously. But even outside of the time travel and villainy, the big problem of the story is that it's honestly really stretched thin. Most of the movie is devoted to our main cast engaging in some lighthearted comedy or watching the slow burn romance between Tenchi's parents blossom, while the actual main conflict takes a back seat. Which is not entirely a bad thing. There are some incredibly funny comedic bits throughout that play into the personalities of our characters. At least I could fit into one of Achika's gym suits, unlike someone I know who had to borrow her gym suit from the gym teacher. <gasps> Ayaka, give me all your clothes. There's no way. Take them off. Right now, come on. And the romance between Tenchi's parents is honestly kind of heartwarming. Seeing young love blossom with little to no drama or will they won't they horseshit is honestly kind of refreshing to see in anime. Listen, Nobuyuki, if you ever manage to build this house, promise that you'll invite me to come and see it. Huh? Come on, what's the matter now? The matter? Nothing at all. <laughs> but as good as all of those things are, it doesn't change that half of this movie is our characters sitting around, twiddling their thumbs, waiting for Washu to call them the present, and have them plan out their next move from there. It does try to keep the drama up before the climactic battle by having Tenchi being constantly on the verge of fading from existence, but those moments are easily solved and so few and far between that they barely register. They almost become a minor running gag by the end of things. Plus, as good as some of the character comedy moments are, there are some bits that fall flat. Nearly all of them involving Mihoshi. Why did they even take her on this trip? Okay, so I bitched about what I don't like about Tenchi Muyo and Love long enough. Here's what I do like about it, and one of them is the animation. You want 90 Sakuga? You got 90 Sakuga. Right from the word go, this anime rubs its big animation budget in your face and says, look how gorgeous this is. Everything about this animation is screaming the fact that this is a motion picture, a theatrical triumph that is slathered in pure spectacle. It makes it feel like everything that's going on on screen is a big, serious deal. Which it should. A main character's very existence is on the line and so easy to forget when this anime is having fun high school antics. But even the small stuff needs to be appreciated in the animation department. No longer constrained by the choppiness of TV budgets, Tenchi Muyo and Love is allowed to really go nuts with the character animation. When having characters talk with one another, they will not just stand in one model while talking, but move in ways that really convey their emotions and overall personalities while having the conversation. It not only adds humor to what's happening, but also really spices up the character interactions and really shows us that the girls are really more than just the tropey characters they seemingly are. But an underappreciated aspect of Tenji Muyo in Love would have to be how it uses the calming atmosphere of the Japanese countryside to its advantage. 
Tenshi Muyo in Love is not just a harem comedy with climactic action scenes thrown in there. It's also a very earnest high school rom it's also a very earnest high school romance story between Tenshi's father Nobuyuki and Tenshi's mother Achika. And whenever there's a moment alone with the two of them, the atmosphere around them becomes calmer and more serene, emphasized by the well-painted backdrops of the Japanese countryside at the beginning of autumn, really making you feel the romance between the two and why they ended up getting married in the first place. But I think what ultimately makes Tenchi Muyo in Love worth it all is its climax and ending. Going beyond how stunningly animated and intense it is, the climax is also the real emotional core of the story. To sum everything up, it almost looks like they have Kane on the ropes, but it turns out that Tenchi and the gang are really no match for him and he escapes into subspace with Tenchi's parents as hostages. Even following after him and getting a power boost from Washu is still not enough to fully take him down. So instead, Washu has Kiyoni man a powerful dimension cannon to destroy Kane. But that's not what ultimately does Kane in. Uh, you and I will build that beautiful house together, right? Oh no, Yuki. I know we will. I've had enough. I will not allow this. I will pay you back. It's an awesome scene and fits thematically well with the theme of the willingness to protect the ones you love, here being both the man she will marry and her future son. And even if he's not an interesting villain, it's kind of satisfying to see Kane be destroyed. But after all that is said and done and our characters go back to their own time, the story between Nobuyuki and Ajika keeps going. We see brief glimpses of their life afterwards, but it's all there to hammer home that Ajika saving Tenchi ultimately came at a price. And in losing that power, her own life may well have been shortened. Ironically, the dry power she used to save my life was the power that could have enabled her to live longer. I wish I could reach back and undo what has been done, but I must accept what I cannot change. Fortunately, I have been told that my parents were able to spend their young years together, happily dreaming and planning and building for the future. Throughout most of the franchise, Tichi's mother was always a figure shrouded in mystery, someone we never got a full glimpse of, but someone who obviously touched the lives of many. And to hear her story told, of the sacrifices she made in order to protect her son, not only gives the movie its emotional core, but also enhances the other stories of the franchise. Yes, this is another example of how new viewers will be locked out of the things that make Tenchi Muyo and Love work. But for the fans, it's a powerful, heartwarming moment, and one that shows us why Tenchi Muyo is considered one of the best if not the best of its genre. Tenchi Muyo in Love for All Its Faults is a pretty good movie from the Tenchi franchise. It tells a previously untold story from a time that always appeared to be hinted at, but never fully explored. And it does so in such a big important fashion with such gorgeous visuals that you can't help but be fully drawn into the movie. It would have been even better if the barrier to entry level of the movie wasn't so unnecessarily high. It could have done a way better job of getting new viewers on board rather than just have them feel like they've missed a week's worth of classes within the first 10 minutes. Maybe cut out a Mihoshi scene here or there? But Tenchi Muyo in Love is still one of the gems that the franchise has to offer because it does what the franchise as a whole does best. Be funny, be romantic, and be incredibly exciting by the end of it all. Shake the alchemy!